Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Jean-Marc Boyanzas. I'm a neurosurgeon specializing in both brain and spinal surgery. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about in this video is posterior lumbar fusion. I'm gonna go over the reasons for which we consider posterior approaches for lumbar fusion. We'll discuss what lumbar fusion means. I'll review the various ways with which we can achieve a lumbar fusion from a posterior approach. And I'll discuss the potential associated risks and complications and expected recovery. This is a standard model of the lumbar spine, which is typically comprised of five lumbar vertebra, numbered top to bottom, lumbar one, all the way down to lumbar five. And then this is your tailbone that we also call the sacrum. We have discs between each and every vertebra that are natural shock absorbers. They play a role in absorbing natural loading stresses. And then behind the discs, we have the spinal canal that houses and protects the spinal nerve roots. One of the most common reasons for which we consider lumbar fusion is due to degenerative conditions of the spine. And typically that involves wear and tear of the discs themselves. Over time, the discs can start degenerating, collapsing, and when they do that, they can produce back pain. And when they collapse backwards into the spinal canal where the nerve roots are located, they can also produce neurological symptoms, such as pain that extends into the buttock or the leg or the foot associated with weakness or numbness. With progressive degenerative changes, sometimes the vertebra can become malaligned and a vertebra can start to slip forward on top of the vertebra below and that can cause what we call a spondylolisthesis. With additional degenerative changes, we can also see progressive malalignment of the spinal column either from a front orientation or from a side orientation, we traditionally call degenerative scoliosis. The most common indications for a lumbar fusion operation are a degenerative spondylolisthesis, that is to say a forward translation or slippage of one vertebra over another. On occasion, we consider lumbar fusion surgery if patients have had multiple disc herniations and requiring several prior discectomy surgeries. We do lumbar fusion surgery for a degenerative scoliosis. We sometimes perform lumbar fusion surgeries for patients who develop synovial cysts from degeneration of the joints that hold the vertebra together. There are various ways of achieving a lumbar fusion. One approach is from an anterior approach, another approach is from a lateral approach, and there are variations on a theme of lateral approaches. And then one of the more common approaches is a posterior approach, meaning from the back itself. When we talk about fusion surgeries, particularly of the lumbar spine, we can discuss inner body fusion surgeries, which typically means that we remove the disc between the bodies of the vertebra above and below and replace that disc by inserting a bone graft, which can be synthetic or it can be made out of cadaver bone. And there are also other materials that one can use to achieve fusion of the inner body variety. The posterior approach for inner body fusion is typically called a posterior lumbar inner body fusion or a transforaminal lumbar inner body fusion. It's one of the preferred methods for achieving fusion. And that involves making an incision in the back, removing part of the spinal canal by removing what's called the lamina, which is the bony wall of the spinal canal and doing what's called a laminectomy. That allows us to enter the spinal canal and effectively decompress the spinal canal. Once we're done removing the lamina and decompressing the spinal nerves inside the spinal canal, we then can gain access to the disc itself, remove the disc and replace it with a bone graft that we talked about. Typically a lumbar fusion involves the placement of titanium screws that are placed into the bony vertebra above and below the area of interest. Those screws effectively allow us to stabilize the vertebra immediately to then allow your body to grow bone through the graft that we inserted between the bodies of the two vertebra to allow the vertebra themselves to fuse together. Another common approach for a posterior lumbar fusion is not to go into the disc and remove it and insert a bone graft inside the disc space, is simply to lay bone down over the bony elements of the spinal column to do what's called a posterior lateral fusion. That type of fusion also typically involves the placement of titanium screws that are then connected with a rod, usually on both sides, to stabilize the vertebra as previously discussed. Risks associated with this operation include a risk of infection, which is usually between one to 5%. Every patient is different in the potential risk of infection, 
And of course, the risk of infection changes depending on how many levels need to be fused and the length of surgery. There are other conditions as well that can predispose to the development of an infection. There can be bleeding from surgery, and typically we're prepared to provide blood transfusions if necessary. One of the distinct advantages of minimally invasive techniques is that we can do fusion surgery typically through much smaller incisions. When I do fusion surgery to fuse a single segment of two vertebra, I usually do it through two one-inch incisions. If we're doing two segments of vertebra, then the incisions are slightly larger. But one of the potential advantages of minimally invasive surgery is that the incisions are smaller. It potentially reduces the infection risk and reduces the need for blood transfusions. It can also potentially reduce the amount of post-operative pain that patients experience because our incisions are a lot smaller and we manipulate the soft tissues of the spine, typically the muscles much less, and we try to minimize any disruption of the normal bony elements when we do a less invasive type of surgery. The goal of a fusion operation is to get the vertebra to fuse together, and that relies on the body's healing processes after surgery. In healthy patients who are non-smokers and who don't have a lot of potential other risk factors, for a failure of fusion, the fusion rate can be as high as 80 to 90%, which means over time the body will react by creating bone, either through the bone graft that was inserted between the two bony vertebra or along the bony elements. However, there is always a possibility that the fusion does not happen, and there are several risk factors for that. Folks who smoke are at the highest risk of not healing properly when undergoing a lumbar fusion surgery, and we typically strongly recommend smoking cessation to give patients the best chance of healing. If you don't heal properly, or if you have a failure of fusion, a lot of your symptoms of back pain and leg pain can come back. That can also lead to disruption of the hardware, the screws could potentially back out or break, and that could require a revision surgery where another operation is necessary to try to get the bony vertebra to fuse together. When the titanium screws are placed, into the vertebral bodies. They are either placed with x-ray guidance in surgery or navigation or the use of a robot. Screws can typically be placed with a very high degree of accuracy, but there is a possibility that the screws are placed in the wrong position. And that can occasionally displace the nerve roots around the spinal canal and cause pain or neurological compromise, such as tingling, numbness, or weakness. If the screws are not properly placed in the bony elements, that could also require a revision operation. The chances of screw malposition is typically less than 5%. Any operation of the spinal column carries a risk of neurologic injury, which is typically inadvertent, but a nerve root injury from spine surgery can produce back pain or leg pain or tingling or numbness or weakness even paralysis or loss of bowel or bladder or sexual function if severe. The chances of a severe nerve injury from a lumbar fusion surgery is typically quite low. It's usually less than 1%. Because the nerve roots lay in a sac that contains spinal fluid within the spinal canal, there is a risk that during the surgery there can be an inadvertent opening of that sac and a leakage of spinal fluid. That's usually identified during surgery and there are several steps that can be taken to close that area of leakage, and it usually is inconsequential if it does happen, which is usually in the order of 5 to 10% of cases. Folks who've had prior spinal surgery are at a slightly higher risk of a spinal fluid leakage uh, during a fusion operation. A fluid leak can cause headaches after surgery, and so we'll typically recommend a period of bed rest while in the hospital or at home. It's very rare for a fluid leak to persist after surgery where it could cause swelling in the wound or the leakage could leak out through the wound, which could predispose to a severe infection. Very uncommon to see that. It usually happens in less than 1% of cases. If patients are having a single level fusion, meaning that only two vertebrae are being fused, that operation can take a couple hours. It can be done with minimally invasive technique, which is my preference. It can be done with robotic assistance, which is also my preference. And it can be a one to two night stay. If you're doing more levels, then the hospitalization can be a little longer. We typically recommend a period of physical restrictions for six weeks after surgery and the need for a brace in the lower back, which typically involves an avoidance of significant bending or twisting or lifting over five to 10 pounds for that period of time. The brace helps to provide a sense of support and it can also serve as a reminder uh, to uh, follow those restrictions. The surgery pain typically lasts anywhere between several weeks or longer. 
folks who've had a lot of pain going into surgery or who have been on pain medication for a long time going into surgery will typically have more pain for a longer period of time. Pain management does usually require a narcotic and a muscle relaxant to help control pain, typically for several weeks to a month. At the six week mark, we'll typically obtain x-rays of the lumbar spine to make sure the hardware is in good position, and then we can remove the brace and start lifting physical restrictions. On occasion, depending on the particular case, we can recommend physical therapy for core strengthening and to start regaining range of motion. Usually fusing one segment, that is to say two vertebra, or even several segments should not translate into a significant limitation of range of motion after lumbar fusion surgery. Once you're healed from a fusion operation, you may have some restrictions that your doctor will recommend, but you can still lead a relatively active lifestyle. One of the possibilities that we can see after a fusion surgery is what we call adjacent segment degeneration, which means that another level another disc in the spinal column can start wearing out and can start breaking down and that can cause recurrent symptoms all over again. Typically the possibility of adjacent segment generation after a lumbar fusion surgery is anywhere between 15 to 25 percent which means that if you've had a lumbar fusion surgery there is a possibility that other levels are going to break down over time and that could even require additional treatment even surgery. This is because the natural axial loading stresses that are applied to the lower back with time and gravity and movement are now transmitted to the other discs that start taking on a greater amount of load and they can undergo accelerated degeneration. The best ways to potentially slow that down or to prevent that are to maintain a normal weight, to do regular core exercises, to strengthen your abdominal muscles and back muscles, avoid certain activities that could put you at risk of accelerated adjacent segment degeneration, and not to smoke. That's it for posterior lumbar fusion surgery. I hope you found this educational and insightful. Bye-bye.